Welcome to Searching for the Question Live. My name is David Orban, and I am very glad to have uh, all of you following the show. We are streaming on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, Twitch, on YouTube. And uh, uh, from today's episode onwards, we will be also uh, streaming live on LinkedIn, uh, as well as um, we have, uh, together with my team, made uh, all the episodes available uh, in an audio-only podcast uh, version where you can uh, subscribe on uh, Apple, iTunes, uh, Amazon Music, uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and uh, I would assume many other places that uh, I may not even be uh, aware of. Uh, you reached out to me saying that you enjoy listening to uh, these episodes when you are driving or or going on a bike or a walk uh, and yeah uh, that uh, it means that the audio version which uh, you can download uh, and uh, then enjoy in these um, settings and and others is the best so uh, go to uh, davidorban.com slash podcast to find the links and subscribe on your favorite uh, platform. And uh, the episode uh, uh, we have today is, uh, for me, uh, very exciting for um, many reasons. Uh, but one of the main reasons is because it represents uh, the um, moment in, in time when a long-awaited technology is becoming real, becoming something that from being uh, theoretical uh, is an engineering challenge and uh, it brings itself with itself so many uh, expectations, uh, so many um, dreams that may become true uh, that is, is very exciting. It was a little bit the case of uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, for decades had toy problems that were so difficult that uh, they were beyond uh, the capabilities of uh, computers. Hey, computer, tell me if this is a cat or a dog. Well, uh, it became almost a joke uh, that AI was unable to answer such an elementary question. And now, uh, for the past 10 years, uh, AI has been delivering at such a speed, at such an acceleration, at such a jolting rate with an increasing speed, with an increasing rate of acceleration, that even experts in the field have been astonished uh, by what uh, it has been uh, capable of. So quantum computing, which is... Uh, the uh, theme of uh, today's conversation is at the threshold of doing that. And we have been waiting for this for, for generations. Well, not many, not 10, not five, but let's say a couple of generations uh, have been holding their breath uh, to, to see uh, if and when quantum computing uh, would become reality. So, I am very happy to welcome uh, Mark uh, Jackson to Searching uh, for the Question live. Uh, welcome, Mark. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, having this conversation about uh, quantum computing, but about quantum technology maybe more in general as well, because uh, uh, this uh, set of fundamental features of our universe uh, can and is being used in 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 not only uh, computing but in but in other uh, things as well. Before uh, we get into that uh, details, uh, tell me uh, wh where are you uh, in meat space uh, physically today? Sure, I'm uh, I'm visiting you from Portland, Oregon at the moment. Um, I. Yeah. I grew up in Portland and I was uh, living in Berkeley, California, but then about a year ago because of COVID, I moved back home to stay with my parents thinking it would be a month or two. And uh, it's, it's been about 13 months now, but it's worked out great. Yeah, welcome to the club. And, uh, and uh, then the next necessary uh, but important question is, uh, have your parents been vaccinated yet? 
They have. Thank you for asking. Um, yes, they were vaccinated about three weeks ago, um, fully. Fantastic. So we're all good. Fantastic. And and what about you? I get my second dose this afternoon. So I'm. Oh, uh, right. Hooray. Hooray. Yeah. Hooray. Uh, I, I only have, uh, according to a non official, but probably unfortunately reliable uh, uh, website, uh, 22 million people ahead of me in the, in the line. So I'm, I'm not quite there yet uh, because I'm speaking to you uh, from Italy and all over Europe. Uh, the vaccination program is, is having a hard time uh, uh, accelerating. Uh, which which hopefully it will. Yes. Uh, and tell me how you uh, came to 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 do the work you do uh, in the field of of quantum computing and quantum technologies in general. Sure, sure. So my background is in physics. Uh, I did my PhD at Columbia University in superstring theory uh, under the supervision of Brian Greene, who some of you might recognize. And, uh, and for several years, this is what I studied, string theory and cosmology. And, uh, and I loved it, but if you're familiar with string theory, uh, the one thing that most people probably know is that we have no evidence of string theory. It's mathematically beautiful, but there's nothing to prove that it's actually uh, a theory of nature. And so I, I kind of looked around for other things to do and I briefly had a startup and then I returned to teaching um, at Singularity University. And I started hearing about um, quantum computing, and this was about five years ago. And so I, I started seeing headlines about quantum computing as a real thing now. And uh, they were actually building these machines. People were starting to write programs for them. And, and I was amazed because this didn't exist in any commercial sense, at least when I was a student. Um, there was academic research into it, but uh, but it, it didn't exist in, a, in any sort of commercial sense. And so I I was delivering presentations about quantum computing, but I kind of felt like a cheerleader on the side of a, of a sports game. Um, I, I missed being a part of it. And I was very lucky um, about uh, four years ago, I had dinner with a friend of mine, Ed Frankel, who's a math professor at Berkeley. And I told him, I really want to get into quantum computing. And do you know of anyone? And he made two introductions. And one of the introductions was to our CEO and founder, Ilias Khan. And, uh, and at the time, CQC was about three years old, and they were looking to expand into the US. And so I, uh, I was very fortunate to be at the right place at the right time. And so I was hired as one of the first US employees at CQC. Uh, uh, because uh, Cambridge could be one of two things, and evidently the Cambridge quantum computing uh, uh, Cambridge here is 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 the UK Cambridge. C correct. We, we actually have an amazing origin story our, uh, our, our founder and CEO, Ilias Khan, was chairman of the Stephen Hawking Foundation. Mm -hmm. And about seven years ago, Hawking told Ilias, um, quantum computing is going to take off. You should get into this business. And oh. so uh, so we're, we're very fortunate that our origin story is actually because of Stephen Hawking and, uh, and, and fortunate that Ilias took this advice. And so that's how we began. And our first scientists were from the University of Cambridge, the, the old school one in England. Um, but yes, many people sometimes think that we're based in Cambridge, that we came out of Harvard or MIT. That's right. That's right. Uh, so um, let's start a little bit uh, from, from the basics. Uh, quantum uh, phenomena uh, are uh, unknowingly labeled uh, as mysterious, uh, as if that explained anything. Uh, and... Uh, uh, they are certainly non-intuitive. Correct. Uh, they are not necessarily mysterious, uh, as long as you have a scientific theory um, that enables you to structure uh, experiments and predict uh, the, the outcomes. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, quantum electrodynamics uh, is the scientific theory that gives uh, the best prediction in terms of precision, number of, uh, uh, of uh, useful uh, digits in its uh, uh, prediction mm -hmm. out of every possible scientific theory we have. Uh, if, he, if we built uh, a, a device, and, and, and we, we do have devices that uh, uh, take advantage of the quantum nature of, of, of electrons, uh, it would be much more precise than, than any, anything else we could ever uh, build 
at least uh, as as things are looking now. So, uh, the the why why um, is it that even though our science about the quantum phenomena is so good, we haven't really be a, been able to build a bridge between our common sense understanding of the macroscopic world and the counterintuitive or non-intuitive nature of the quantum world? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. And everything that you just said is correct. Um, I'm, I'm glad so, so, uh, so, so you, you, were, you were exactly correct even about the, the QED uh, remark that, that this is the most precise measurement we have. We've, we've had something that we call quantum mechanics for about 100 years. And sometimes the word quantum is invoked for something to seem mysterious or, uh, or, or something. And, and I see this as a buzzword a lot of times. And I think the general public doesn't understand that quantum has a very specific meaning. And it's not just it's mysterious and we don't understand it. So we label it quantum. That's, that's not at all what it is. We have a very precise definition of what it is. It's a little counterintuitive, as, as you correctly called it. Um, but we have a, a mathematical understanding and we can make predictions and everything um, that we, every experiment that we've done for a hundred years has confirmed that quantum physics is correct. And we're learning more about it. And now we can build machines uh, to compute based on these principles. But, um, but yes, so the, the mathematics behind quantum physics is simply that there are some variables, um, there's some observations that we can do on nature that interfere or affect other measurements. And so the classic example is, is position and momentum, that if you try to measure the position of a particle very precisely, it affects the momentum and vice versa. And energy and time have a, have a similar conjugate relationship. And so we've, over the past hundred years, we've learned uh, kind of the, the sophisticated mathematics behind this. And this is why we understand how the atom works, why, why uh, atoms have the energy levels that they do. So quantum physics makes a very specific prediction uh, for the energy levels. And this was one of the first ways that we hit upon quantum physics. And that seems a little strange because I can see where you are roughly, you seem pretty well localized right now and your momentum doesn't seem to be very much. You don't seem to be, be moving very fast. So how can it be that um, I know where you are and your momentum at the same time if quantum physics tells me that I shouldn't know those two things? And the reason is because quantum physics has a scale which is set by um, a, a parameter called h-bar. And h-bar is very, very small. It's, uh, it's at the atomic level. And so on a day-to-day -day scale, we don't really see quantum physics things happening. Um, things seem pretty well localized. We know where they are and we know what their momentum or, or uh, roughly their velocity is. And so this is why quantum physics seems very counterintuitive because we have a description which we call classical physics, which has served us very well for centuries. And then uh, about a hundred years ago, all that got upended that things are a little strange. And one of the strangest things about quantum physics and something that even very uh, brilliant people like Einstein fought against was that quantum physics is non-deterministic. Uh, even if you use your full arsenal of mathematical tools, you can't predict for certain what will happen. The best that you can do is come up with probabilities of what will happen. I can say that it, it, this will have a, if I measure something, there's a 30% of it having this result and a 70% chance of it having this result. That's the best I can do. Um, and, I can and, uh, and what is what is uh, uh, apparently unfortunate is that it has been proven that contrary to what Einstein expected, it isn't a question of just going deeper and find what are the hidden variables that uh, eliminate uh, the necessity of playing with these probabilities or probability distributions. Uh, it looks like uh, uh, the, the the nature of the universe is based on on, on those probabilities, uh, and so we we are bound to to have to cope uh, with uh, uh, what uh, quantum quantum reality represents, uh, and just keep uh, sustaining the effort uh, uh, there. 
Um, what, I, what I think is that we haven't been uh, courageous uh, enough. Uh, we, we, we are lazy mammals and our hippocampus uh, serve us well. When someone uh, throws us a ball, we are able to catch it. Uh, so uh, we um, are, are, are just uh, letting it go and say, okay, that works, so let's keep using it. If we were more aggressive in questioning, uh, uh, then uh, we would be uh, actually able to possibly build some kind of, of intuition. Um, and, and I don't know if uh, long-time practitioners uh, of your field uh, have, have that, which could, for example, mean to be able to say, hmm, this experiment could uh, generate interesting results. I'm not sure what results, and I'm not sure exactly the details about how the experiment should be designed, but my intuition about the quantum world tells me that that is where we should be going. So, yes. So, so that's a that's a perfect segue into what was called the the Bell's theorem or the Bell inequality. And uh, to, to give the background on that, as you uh, as you mentioned, about a hundred years ago, when people were discovering quantum physics, there was this this fierce debate over whether nature was intrinsically uh, non-deterministic, whether you really couldn't make predictions, or whether you could make predictions, it was just that we weren't smart enough yet to have figured it out. And so it, it, that's kind of how it turned out. It looked like we could come up with probabilities just because of our ignorance of, of certain variables which we didn't know yet, uh, so-called hidden variables. And um, a very clever physicist um, in, from Ireland named John Bell, so apparently he he believed that there were hidden variables. And so he, he devised an experiment to test this, a very clever experiment, and what he found was the opposite, that there were no hidden variables, that nature is fundamentally non-deterministic, that nature really did roll dice, uh, as Einstein once uh, said in objection to this. Um, so, so that's the most fundamental thing. And I personally think this is the most interesting experiment in all of science, because it says for the first time that uh, that we can't predict what's going to happen. Uh, there's a fundamental barrier to our our um, knowledge about something, and uh, and I think most most people have never heard of of John Bell and the, and the Bell inequality and the Bell's experiment. And, and, and here is another okay. experiment uh, that that uh, a lot of people haven't uh, heard about, and and which uh, puts uh, Bell in a, in an interesting company uh, uh, because Michelson Morley were two physicists who similarly yeah. uh, 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 set out to prove the existence of ether, which would be, uh, they thought, the um, substance uh, that uh, supported the propagation of light. Uh, and as uh, Earth moved across this uh, hypothetical ether, the speed of light would be different depending on uh, the direction. And so they designed an interferometer uh, and and uh, the the result was the opposite uh, of what uh, they expected. So so uh, from a historical point of view or from an epistemological point of view, it must be uh, very weird to be remembered uh, for the opposite of one's own uh, convictions uh, in the case of both Bell and Michelson and Morley. I wonder if someone has written a book or an article about scientists that set out to prove one thing and ended up proving the opposite for which that is named, yeah. And 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 did they, uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, well, obviously changed uh, their mind, but what were the subsequent steps? Uh, was that changing of their mind something sufficiently traumatic to leave them, um, in, uh, leave them saddened or, 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 or in some ways handicapped uh, uh, in terms of further exploration? Or were they spurred, and were they uh, catalyzed uh, in a in a novel direction where their creativity and ability to imagine new types of experiments was was uh, 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 renewed? Uh, well, maybe maybe there is, or or it uh, still needs to be to be written. Um, now, talking about 
these kinds of surprising principles driving the universe, uh, the lay public uh, is then driven to an extreme which physicists recoil against or, or, or from. And that is to say, oh, if a given set of principles is invalid, such as, for example, our ability to simultaneously establish variables that are correlated uh, based on the Heisenberg uh, principle of, of indetermination, then all principles must be put in question and, and are almost certainly falsifiable. And a couple of these, uh, which I would like you to comment on, are uh, the maximum speed of propagation of information in the universe, mm -hmm. aka speed of light, as, as more commonly is described, and uh, the principle of causality. And, and the two are, are related, right? So, first of all, would you agree that uh, it is quite likely that we will never falsify those principles and 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 why that matters sure so you're correct when when one first hears about quantum physics um and and things are uncertain and you can't have complete knowledge or predictions about things it's tempting to say oh so we should just give up physics is useless uh, let's go home what's the point in doing everything Th that's not true uh quantum physics does place a limit on on certain things that you can know but the fact that you and I have computers in front of us and we can communicate like this, uh, clearly laws of physics do work. We can do some things. Um, it just means that the laws of physics are, ugh, laws of physics are a little bit different from what we, what we thought they were. The examples that you mentioned of, of speed of light and causality, both of these came about from, um, from Einstein's special relativity. And so this was something he developed in 1905 because people had noticed uh, there were some cracks in physics. And, uh, and one of those cracks was that electric and magnetic waves were governed by, um, by four equations, which are now called Maxwell's equations. And these worked very well. They described how electric and magnetic fields propagate and how electricity works and things like this. But funny things happened as you approached the speed of light. So it worked fine if you were just sitting there but as you approach the speed of light, the equations didn't really behave properly. And um, because of this and some other things, Einstein developed what is now called the, the theory of special relativity. And it says that space and time are connected in a very funny way. And that when you, when you add velocities together, when you, when you think about how to transform something, if it's moving, it's not as simple as you would think. For example, if a if you're on a train and the train is moving 50 miles per hour and you're walking at um, one mile per hour, you would think that, as seen from someone on the ground, that you are moving at 51 miles per hour. It, it's, it's so simple that we don't even think about it. You just add the velocities together and it doesn't occur to you to do otherwise. Einstein showed that's not quite true. It's, uh, it's, it's more like 50.99999 miles per hour. And that's unimportant, of course, on a day-to-day -day basis, but as you approach the speed of light, that that little difference becomes more and more um, pronounced. And so, um, what he showed was that when you when you approach the speed of light, Maxwell's equations behave in very unexpected ways. And what happens is that there's a, there's a speed limit to the universe. You can't if matter objects which have matter and mass, uh, which like you and I, we can move. We can have a velocity, but it could never exceed the speed of light because it would take an infinite amount of energy to do that. Light can go at the speed of light. It has zero mass. And so light can only go the speed of light, neither less nor more. Um, and we've never found anything that, that could move faster than the speed of light. And so it does kind of put this, this uh, cutoff, the speed limit on the universe. Could you could you have something that, go, that goes faster than that? Um, it's, it's theoretically possible, but I'll explain a few reasons why it's very unlikely. So, so special relativity is uh, it's a local statement, meaning that just there in your neighborhood, you could never go faster than the speed of light. 
But 10 years later, Einstein developed what's now called general relativity, which says that gravity is actually the curvature of space and time. And so space and time can be curved in, in kind of funny ways. We just take for granted that space and time are flat. Um, and so it is possible, and people have explored this, that you could have unexpected, um, even more unexpected relationships between space and time if you allow for curvature. Now, could you have the extreme example of, of uh, like going back in time, like a, a back to the future type scenario where you interact with your past self or your parents or something, and which would of course affect your future? We don't think so for the reasons that pop culture has pointed out. Uh, it just seems like there's a paradox and, uh, and the mathematics bear this out. You just can't get a consistent theory of, uh, of, of physics out of this. Is it possible that someone could cleverly figure out a way to keep it consistent? It, it's possible, um, but nothing that we've seen so far has indicated that that's possible. Um, I, I have a, 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 the, the point of view of a universal Darwinist of uh, the set of laws of uh, our universe. And I believe that we are sitting on a branch that eliminated that uh, possibility because uh, the ability of those other branches where the laws of their physics may allow this are non-fertile. They cannot uh, derive the complex structures that uh, open their eyes and, and, and look out wondering, uh, wow, this is a wonderful, even though strange uh, universe. Uh, uh, that is just too strange, too exotic, and the whole thing falls kind of apart um, because of the the, the, the paradoxes that uh, that you mentioned. I wish uh, uh, for a historical accident, uh, we wouldn't call it theory of relativity. I would much prefer calling it uh, theory of absolutes or theory of invariance uh, because actually, uh, it, it better lets you understand that, for example, the speed of propagation of information is invariant, regardless of how you move and where you move and, and other similar things, as well as it gives a, 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 an easier um, historical understanding that, that we already had uh, Galilean invariance and Newtonian invariance. So Einstein continued in that his revolution was actually a continuation of understanding what to focus on, what are the invariants uh, that, that we must preserve, even though they lead to unexpected uh, consequences. Uh, I, 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 I love these topics uh, too much, and we could end up uh, talking here for hours uh, without going to uh, quantum uh, computing. Um, so. We have been successful in going from fundamental science uh, to applied science, to engineering, and to commercial applications in many fields. Um, we have known about uh, water evaporating for thousands of years. Uh, we've been boiling pots of soup long before we had steam engines. Uh, the 20th century has been characterized by a shortening uh, of our ability from discovering some fundamental phenomenon to applying it uh, and, and uh, uh, exploiting it for, for our uh, needs. And, and quantum phenomena are in that, in that shortening Mm, and and uh, so so let's look at what are the features and and how are we trying to exploit the features of quantum phenomena in order to compute better uh, and and where are we in the applications of 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 that? Sure, sure. So let me first start with uh, with the motivation for why we we even thought about building these things that we now call quantum computers. We've known for some time that that some problems are tougher to solve than others, and uh, and there, there's a whole uh, branch of of mathematics and science uh, concerned with this. And one example, uh, which which is relevant here, is in in chemistry, 
we know what the equations are for studying molecules. And we've, we've known this for about 100 years. The equations are, are very well known. The problem is that as a molecule gets bigger, as a molecule gets bigger, you have more and more atoms. And every atom has several electrons, probably. And every electron is interacting with every other electron in the whole molecule. And so even though you know what the equations are, trying to solve for all of them simultaneously is, uh, is very difficult. And it becomes more and more difficult as the molecule gets bigger. And so only in the very simplest cases can you, can you actually solve this. And so this is one example of a, of a much broader class of, of problems. About 40 years ago, a, a very famous physicist named Richard Feynman, who, uh, who developed many things, including the, like the path integral theory that you kind of alluded to earlier, he recognized that this was, this was going to be a major stumbling block because if we ever hope to make any progress in doing chemical calculations, we wouldn't be able to use normal computers. You might be tempted to say, well, computers get better every year. Um, our computers today are certainly better than they were 40 years ago uh, by, by a factor of a billion. But if you, if you look at the scaling, that's still not good enough. The molecules become so much more complex as they become bigger that we never ever would be able to, uh, to solve these using normal computers. And so what Feynman suggested was these equations that we're trying to solve are quantum in nature. So we should be using a quantum computer to do this. And what he meant by that is to take advantage of this uncertainty that we see at the quantum scale. Normal computers use things called bits, which are just ones and zeros. So everything on, on the computers in front of us right now uh, at the most basic level are ones and zeros. Even though we have graphics and color and everything, the way that the computer actually thinks and stores and, and calculates is based on ones and zeros. Quantum computers and, and quantum physics don't, doesn't use ones and zeros. It uses um, something that we, we call a quantum bit or a qubit, which can be a, a zero and a one at the same time. And the technical name for that is superposition. And it relates back to what we talked about a few minutes ago that nature sort of exists in this indeterminate state. And only upon measuring it, do you get an outcome and you, you can, know the probability of the outcomes, but you don't get to know exactly what's going to happen with certainty. And so what Feynman proposed was keeping these qubits in this undeterminate state, doing calculations, and then only at the very end do you make the measurements. Now, the reason that he proposed this was because as long as the qubit remains in this state of superposition, you're sort of like doing two calculations at once. You're sort of doing a calculation with a zero and doing a calculation with a one simultaneously. It's a, it's a little more technical than that, but that, that's kind of the, the heuristic. And so if you had 10 qubits, that could represent about a thousand different combinations at once. When you think about all the different permutations, that's about a thousand. 20 qubits could represent about a million states. 30 qubits could represent about a billion. And so every time you add a qubit, you're doubling the number of configurations that you can consider simultaneously. A normal computer would have to consider all those possibilities one by one. And, that, and that's what takes so long, is that it has to go through all these different possibilities one by one. A quantum computer, if, if programmed correctly, could look at them all simultaneously, and the correct answer sort of emerges because all the incorrect answers cancel each other out. Now, um, I, I want to emphasize this only works in very certain cases. You can't simply take a, a computer program written for a normal computer and run it on a quantum computer and expect it to be a million times faster. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I've kind of seen that misunderstanding elsewhere. So I, I want to make that very clear that quantum computers will never replace normal computers. It's only for very specific problems, but for those problems, it could, it could solve the problems much, much faster than a normal computer could, so much faster that we could solve them when we couldn't have solved them before. And chemistry was the, the first example that Feynman uh, focused upon, but we now have several other examples uh, related to machine learning and uh, natural language processing and, and even ones related to cybersecurity. And so we're, we're just starting to now uncover what kind of applications quantum computers are good at. So that, that's the motivation um, behind, it, behind quantum computing. Um um, the, the second part of the question was uh, what, what is the status uh, of our ability to, to build them. Before you answer that, actually, 
um, it, it, I remember um, more than than ten years ago when I uh, was uh, at the, at the launch of uh, one of the first commercial quantum computers uh, built by uh, D Wave. Uh, uh, Jordi Rose, uh, the, the, the founder, met uh, a few of us in an invitation-only event. And the day later, they were on the cover of The Economist. And the whole world of uh, uh, quantum computing uh, uh, specialists uh, in academia uh, shouted, oh, it's a fraud, it's impossible, it is never going to work, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and I, I had a very um, cynical... Uh, reaction to their skepticism. What I said at the time is, well, and I don't know if you remember Sergei Bubka, the uh, the Paul Walt uh, champion who um, in the 80s, maybe the 90s, would go from tournament to tournament, always improving his own personal record by one centimeter. And it was evident to everyone that he could jump 30 centimeters right away more but he was better off collecting the various prizes. And a little bit to me, it sounded at the time that uh, uh, that the D-Wave was disturbing the plan of the academic world that was better off, uh, you know, getting grants and another grant and a grant. And they were not necessarily incentivized from creating a workable commercial computer that may not have being able to live up to the expectations of a universal quantum computer because it is very specialized, very, uh, you know, narrow in its in its abilities, but still, uh, it it uh, proved the reality of, of and the tangibility of of something that that uh, was only theoretical until then. So, are there still people who are skeptical about? the feasibility, we established the desirability. Are there still people who are skeptical about the feasibility uh, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, quantum computers? And, and uh, let me, uh, before you answer, bring up uh, the comment from Tiago, who said, I remember following the news back then, and I, and I uh, like he says, how they decentralized research. Um, so hi, Tiago, thanks for your, your comment and remark there. So Mark, are the skeptics done or, or they are still very eager to, to tell everyone is just a scammer? That, that's a really good question. So this was a little before my time, but from what I understand, so when Feynman suggested that we build these quantum computers, there was interest, but of course, this was far beyond what was capable at the time. So there was a lot of academic research and apparently the joke was that quantum computers were 10 years away for about 35 years. So, uh, so academics were working on it and they kept saying, yeah, yeah, maybe in about 10 years we'll be there. And that, that continued for several years. About seven years ago, there were some, some discoveries made that made people think that this actually could be commercially viable. And then the private sector got into it. And, and you're very correct in pointing out there is a, a cultural difference between academics and the business world. Um, the business world has, has a lot of money they can put behind it, um, but they have very specific use cases that, that they, they want to make money off this. Uh, they're not just doing it for the benefit of humanity. Um, academics... Having, having a high number of citations is not enough. Correct, ex exactly. Uh, there's different incentives at work in each area. And uh, and so academics, you know, you have the, the luxury, um, you can explore whatever suits your interest at that time, um, just, just for the benefit of understanding, um, but money is a little tougher to come by and and such. And so, uh, so yeah, about seven years ago, the commercial world, world got into this. And so many companies like Google, IBM, Honeywell, Microsoft um, started putting vast amounts of money into this. And, and D-Wave was, was a little bit before this um, because they're using an approach called quantum annealing, um, whereas the others were interested in a gate-based approach. And so there, there's a little bit of mismatch in the timescales there, um, but that's why. To answer your skeptic question, uh, there are certainly still skeptics, but the, the goalposts have changed. I think the skeptics a few years ago were saying, you might get one or two qubits, but you'll never get 100 qubits. And, uh, and now we, we do have 100 qubits. And 
uh, just a few months ago, IBM and Google published very aggressive roadmaps. They expect to have a thousand qubits in three years, and they expect to have a million qubits in 10 years. And there's no, I'm not aware of any impediment to that scaling. Uh, a lot of work has to be done. We're not there yet, but groups seem committed to this, both um, both resource-wise and, and financially and everything, to doing this. And there's this whole ecosystem that's now developed around the field. When I joined CQC about three and a half years ago, there were about 10 credible startups that I was aware of uh, doing quantum computing. There's now hundreds. I don't even know all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many that I can't keep track of. It seems like every week there's a new technical breakthrough. There's a new startup getting funded, a new commercial project being announced. Um, there's so much more interest in this now. So there are skeptics about whether it will scale and we'll have uh, like, like general purpose quantum computers, but they already exist. People are already using them. And we're, we're actually pretty close to, to getting what's called a quantum advantage um, where, where a quantum computer could, could do some useful things better than a classical computer. Um, another question comes into my mind and it is slightly back to being theoretical, unfortunately, but I cannot stop myself. A quantum computer uh, is a, a, a strange object. Uh, Mm, and and in the future we may have uh, different kinds, but today all of the quantum computers, unless I'm mistaken, uh, uh, or 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 many of them, not maybe not all, because optical ones may may not, but many of them um, use uh, superconductivity, and and we only have superconductivity at uh, very low temperatures, so low temperatures that nowhere in the known universe there are temperatures so close at absolute zero because even the uh, uh the the statistical measure of the temperature of outer space intergalactic space is warmer than that uh, the 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 temperature we bring these machines to just uh tenths of thousands of kelvin from from absolute zero um, and Another reason why they are strange, at least uh, based on our common sense understanding of the world, is that their fundamental objective is maintain their quantum nature for as long as possible, for as large a number of its components as possible. Uh, in, in quantum uh, terminology, it must be uh, in a coherent state. Um, and, and so the question is, would it be useful and maybe is it already done to find natural analogs of macroscopic quantum objects that could inspire ways that we would design and, 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 and build quantum computers? Because, for example, my hand, uh, yes, is, is quantistic in its fundamental nature, but it doesn't exhibit any of that. Mm -hmm. it, it collapses its coherence uh, uh, billions of times a second, uh, and, and I'm not able to use its quantum nature. Are there things in nature that we studied and we uh, concluded that they are, they are quantum but macroscopic? Yes, so there are several different technologies being used to build quantum computers. So, so I talked about qubits, like they were some object that that's uh, read, readily available or something. So you have to actually build a qubit. You have to use technology to do that. And as you mentioned, superconducting technology is is a popular approach. Uh, Google, IBM, Rigetti, um, part of the group at Intel are all using this. And as you correctly say, you have to keep these uh, these quantum these, these qubits at nearly absolute zero, and that's why they have these giant uh, cryogenic chambers. Uh, they they kind of look like chandeliers being lowered into these uh, refrigerators. There are other approaches being used. Uh, so so another popular approach is the ion trap method, and this is being used by Honeywell and IonQ. You don't have to keep them uh, so so cold. You actually use lasers to man manipulate the charged particles. And 
uh, one of the advantages is that these uh, these ion trap qubits are much more stable. Uh, they they can last quite a bit longer uh, with their coherence time than superconducting qubits. The disadvantage is that operations take slower. The actual calculations. So there's there's a trade-off, and it will probably be that one approach is better for some type of problems, and and another approach is better for others. There's also photonic, where you use photons or or little particles of light to do the calculations. And there's two startups, uh, Xanadu and PsiQuantum, who are using this. And the advantage to photonic is that we we know a lot about generating photons and using them, and you can put them on a chip. So uh, so so we already have these foundries that can put uh, integrated photonics and silicon on a chip together. And so you could have many, many qubits very easily. The scaling is kind of immediate. It's it's the fundamental technology that needs to be worked out, but it's very easy to get lots of them as, as long as you can do a few. And so um, you're, you're very correct in that we're still understanding how these technologies fit together. And it will probably be that some technologies are better for building quantum computers for one type of problem and other approaches are better for others. As for macroscopic examples of this, it, it, would, it would strike me as difficult uh, just because these are quantum objects that we're manipulating and it's so counterintuitive to what we experience on a day-to-day -day scale. And so that's why, that's why I, th I think all of the, the qubit construction is, uh, is done on, on very small scales using kind of counterintuitive type approaches. Um, the approaches, as you said, are, are, are different and there is an entire ecosystem that is being born. The very uh, 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 nature of the multitude of, of approaches uh, 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 supports what, what you said, uh, that, that it is hard to uh, keep uh, up with everything that is going on in the in the field and it is beautiful because it is it is the very demonstration of uh, the health uh, and, and 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 the variety and uh, and the vividness um, uh, and the promising variety of 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 these approaches so uh, tell me more specifically uh, cambridge quantum computing uh, what uh, what what does it do um, i'm looking at um, a website telling me it raised Seventy-two million dollars of funding. Congrats! And lot not enough. You would like <laughs> ten times as much. Uh, maybe the number is not even correct. Uh, so, so what what is what does it want to do with the, with that money and and the, the next uh, uh, rounds that uh, it will aim to raise? Sh sure. So, uh, so thank you. And and I believe the number is correct. I'm not on the investment side of it, but uh, but but that does sound about right. So Cambridge Quantum Computing's mission is, is to be the preeminent uh, supplier of quantum software. So we, we don't build the computers that we've been talking about, but we develop software to run on all of them. And we have expertise in quantum compilers and chemistry and machine learning, uh, as well as cybersecurity. Um, we, so some, some of these quantum applications are for our own use, uh, things that we, we find interesting and we think will be valuable, and some are projects that we've done with commercial partners. So sometimes companies come to us and they say, could you design a, a quantum application to produce this result that we're interested in? And so we've done that many times. Um, so financial companies, there's kind of an obvious incentive. Can you come up with a more accurate trading algorithm uh, or a better optimization type algorithm? Sometimes it's, it's scheduling, sometimes it's chemistry. Uh, they're interested in some chemical results. And so we have a chemistry application to, uh, to produce these results. So we, we do that on the application side. I think the most important thing that we've done to date is actually the compiler uh, or quantum software development kit that we've developed, which we call Ticket. Uh, that's T-K-E-T. -E and I, I think many of the viewers right now are familiar. Yeah, right there. Um, when you program a computer, you need to have a compiler because what you as a human programmer type in will probably be in C or Python or what have you, and so you can understand it. It's intelligible to a human, but the computer understands something completely different. It's machine language, and so you need a compiler to convert what you've typed into instructions for the machine. And a good compiler not only does that translation, it does it efficiently. It produces a program which is short and doesn't use as much memory. What we've done is we've produced a quantum compiler ticket, 
which allows you to you write your quantum program in your favorite quantum programming language, uh, so we support all the popular ones, and it turns it into instructions for all the quantum hardware available today. So that, that could be IBM or Honeywell or Google or several minor ones. Um, you don't need to worry about the differences between all those different quantum platforms. You just write your program and Ticket will take care of the rest. Um, because there's a lot of differences in, in how the different quantum computers are built and how the qubits are arranged. You don't need to worry about any of that. You just write your program and Ticket will execute it on that machine that you've chosen. And, and this uh, answers uh, a question asked by Maurizio. Um, are there specific languages being developed for quantum computing? And, uh, and, and uh, absolutely, you're, you're, you're manipulating the qubits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Com compilers that cut across uh, various uh, types of hardware. So the abstraction layer being achieved is such that, as you said, developers can think about the problem set and the algorithms, and they so uh, what used to be uh, in uh, in in uh, uh, IT world uh, the assembly language, uh, uh, we are now beyond that because That's the right. language was touching the hardware and it was specific uh, uh, with the particular hardware, and now you are telling me that ticket uh, from uh, CQC. Uh, is uh, maybe not at the visual basic stage, maybe not even at the basic stage uh, uh, of uh, the late 70s, but uh, it is better than than tinkering in, in assembly language. That's a, that's a very good analogy, yes. So you still have to know about quantum physics. You still have to know how to, how to program qubits and how to design a quantum algorithm and what's happening, but you don't need to be concerned with the the real hardware specific things about how qubits are aligned and, and everything. You just worry about writing your program as, as what we call a quantum circuit and Ticket will do the rest. And uh, um, something that, that I, I want to emphasize is that about two months ago, we removed all licensing restrictions from, from Ticket. And so, so it's available for download for the public right now. Um, and there it is. That was, uh, that was fantastic timing. Yeah, so there it is. So if you just go to this GitHub repo, it's available for download for free. Um, just go ahead and install it. Uh, all the instructions and, and uh, documentation is there. And if you can come up with a million dollar killer quantum app, fantastic. Um, you don't and, need to. Uh, and you know, you know why is that? You know why did you, you did make that decision? We want uh, everyone. We want everyone to benefit from this. Um, it wasn't. And, and why? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do that? We're now at an inflection point where. People are starting to get excited about quantum computing. It's starting to be close to practically a, a, applicable um, for real world cases. We didn't just want it to be for our own internal development or for corporations who who pay us quite but a bit. It is still for you. But you, you know why this is still for you? And it's it's clever. It's, it's important. I, I'm all for it. I'm happy and excited. This is a recruiting move because uh, you cannot raise money without finding the people you can pay with that money. So, so, so you have to tell your investors, yeah, give me another hundred million people, uh, sorry, hundred million dollars, and I know who are the people I want to hire, because the the bottleneck now is is how many clever people you can find that 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 you can hire, and and so this this uh, open source strategy is is enabling you to to have those people flock around the excitement that this availability gives you we do certainly hope that it creates uh, a, a community of, of people and it, and it will be a good tool uh, as you say for uh, for identifying who um who really contributes um we we only ask that if you do use it just credit us if you write an article about it and give us feedback on how we can make it better um that's that's all we ask so uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful that that is uh, i i love it uh, and 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 then of course the the uh the downer is that uh very few people will be able to run their code on real quantum computers so two questions around that. One, uh, I remember, you know, whenever 
in the in literally in the in the in the seventies, I would run uh, some small uh, computers on pen and pencil. Hmm. I, I had no computers, and I and I was thinking about computers, so I would just simulate. And whether it was Game of Life uh, uh, by Conway, Cellular Automata, or it was some vector game of cars that can only accelerate and then decelerate uh, one square at a time, and I would literally compute trajectories uh, on on paper and so on. I would be simulating. Uh, digital computer without having one. Is it worth simulating quantum computers if you are desperate enough and you want to use a ticket uh, on on traditional computers? Yes, uh, simulation of quantum computers is not just for the desperate. It's it's an essential tool right now um, because quantum computers tend to be very expensive. Um, well, anyone given a choice would prefer having a real one, right? Yeah, yeah no, if, I had, if I had a real one, uh, I would do it. Um, I should mention IBM has very kindly made available their lower end devices, uh, like like the, the five qubit, for example. Um, so right now, if you if you just Google IBM Q experience, you will be taken to a site. You just create an account for free, and you can actually program their their quantum computer and execute programs on it. It's um, it's only a few qubits, and there's often a, a Q because it's public, and a lot of people are trying to do what you're doing. Um, but but there are publicly available quantum computers for free. Um, if you would like to use something with more qubits, the options are you could you can use a simulator and you can simulate up to about precisely right there. You can simulate up to about thirty qubits just on your laptop, and you can simulate up to about forty qubits on a supercomputer. And that might sound funny because. Uh, Going from 30 to 40 doesn't sound that dramatic. It, it sounds like only a 33% increase. But remember, every qubit that you're adding, you're doubling the number of configurations. And so uh, so that's actually a thousand-fold increase in, uh, in in how many configurations you're considering. And so, so simulators do exist. There's many of them. If you would like access to real premium quantum computers, there's a few options. You can, you can contact uh, some of these. Uh, hardware vendors directly, like IBM or Honeywell. Um, sometimes the terms that they offer for access isn't favorable either for academics or for startups. Uh, that there's a long contract and it costs quite a bit of money. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have a, an especially close relationship with both IBM and Honeywell. With IBM, we're uh, we're actually an IBM hub, which means we're authorized to resell access in increments of six months to their device. And you would you would use a premium device. You would only be sharing it with a few other groups. One of which would be us. So we would work on a project together, and we can re we can resell that under very favorable terms um, compared to if you went to IBM directly, for example. Just, and just, to, just to make it uh, simple, um, as an order of magnitude, what does that uh, mean? Uh, are we talking about uh, millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands? If if you went to uh, IBM directly oh, for with you, with you. For, for us hundreds hundreds of thousands, a few hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars, yeah. uh, and 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 that would mean both getting access to the machine and access to your expertise over the right. course of six months uh, to be able to do something in those uh, in those um, uh, fields that that you mentioned before and and maybe others because uh, some client uh, could come to you and say hey why don't we do x and it could be a very interesting surprise for you as well now the the, the reason why that is very interesting is because i i talk about uh, uh, edge technologies uh, all the time and i always mention um the uh, concrete possibility of signing up, for example, at IBM or, or other places. D-Wave also uh, has an API now that you can start using. And I don't remember how many milliseconds they give you of, of computing time in total for free. Um, but but then, of course, the jump uh, is, is just too big uh, to say, OK, we are convinced. Here is $10 million. Let's buy one, right? Uh, so so uh, making it very explicit, as we just did, that between playing with toy systems like the ones that uh, you can do for free 
and the $10 million or whatever the number that uh, allows you to own one of these beasts, there is actually one or maybe more steps and, and the threshold is, is a few hundred thousand dollars because uh, the number of companies that should be very excited about this middle step gets vastly larger and and uh, pretty soon at that point uh, mechanisms of peer pressure competitive uh, advantages uh, the, the 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 very survivability of certain uh, uh, initiatives uh, can change drastically uh, and uh, and and so that is very very interesting i'm happy happy to learn about that so the engagement that you described is um, um, is 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 consultative. Um, I I would assume that that is not a, a joint venture or a, or a partnership because you would provide expertise, but the intellectual property of the specific application, even though using your open source tools, would pertain would belong to to the client. Is that correct? So for most other quantum companies, that would be correct. We have a different business model. Uh, we we actually don't do consulting, um, rather uniquely. We we love working with companies on projects, but in our model, we retain the IP for the quantum computing part of it, and we license the results to the client. And that's all very that's all very negotiable. So they this is all discussed beforehand of what they're interested in for how long for what application, um, but we. We're interested in building applications, and so for that, we have to keep control over the over the quantum program. Um, okay, so so let's uh, unpack uh, that uh, a, a bit. Um, the, the 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 traditional stack uh, is uh, you know hardware, um, fundamental or basic libraries, input output, whatever else then algorithms that uh, run on top and then uh, various application layers that can go uh, way way uh, up uh, one one on top of the other operating system i forgot in the middle etc and, and 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 i can understand that what you want is to improve your algorithms you you want to improve your your ability to serve across uh, all uh, uh, your engagements all your 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 clients um let's concentrate on the on the top part so you say the client takes home the results for example a given molecule that has been understood or designed okay or or a certain uh, what was another example that you made ai a certain ai model that was uh, that was developed or 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 or, or something like that uh, since you retain everything else, does it mean that if they say, oh, uh, sorry, we forgot, let's do a, a variation, let's do a second molecule, do they have to start from scratch? It, it wouldn't be starting from scratch. If it's something at all similar, then presumably the, the work that we've already developed uh, would be a good starting point. And so we could we could add that feature, and depending on how difficult and how much time that would take. Um, that would be another project. But um, but yeah, we recognize that not every not every company can fit within this model. And and so um, uh, that that's that's just how it is. But many companies have have done this with us. Um, there's there's to use your example, like some molecule, they want to know the properties of this using quantum computing. And so we've developed an application to to determine that. Um Tiago asks a, a question that is uh, mm, pertinent to one of the areas of research that you, you mentioned, or applications rather that you mentioned. He asks, um, are we going to break uh, current encryption and are you working on quantum safe uh, cryptography? That's, a, that's an excellent question and that's, uh, that's one I get a lot. If there's one thing that people have seen headlines about with quantum computers, it's that it has something to do with, with breaking cryptography. And this is because the mathematical formulas that we use for about 
of, of online encryption right now, they happen to be formulas that quantum computers are good at undoing. And uh, this was realized about 25 years ago. Um, so we hear a lot about hacking and stuff, but most of the time it's because of a human error. It's not because the formulas were directly undone using computers. It's, it's because someone wrote their password down somewhere or something. And, and so uh, about 25 years ago, it was realized by this uh, Peter Shore that quantum computers would be good at directly undoing the mathematical formulas. Now, back then, quantum computers didn't really exist, and so no one was very concerned about this. But now, as quantum computers become more powerful, this is starting to cause concern. And so, uh, so it, it doesn't seem to be possible today, but in a few years, it might be. And many people, computer scientists and mathematicians and physicists, have been developing new formulas which we don't think quantum computers could undo. We're not sure yet. That's why there's a contest and people are still investigating them. Um, and, and right now I think there are seven finalists and in a few years we expect to have uh, the, the final one or two. Now, uh, now what does this mean for the public? It means I wouldn't wait until you read about quantum hacking to upgrade to these new post-quantum encryption algorithms. I would make the change now. And there's two reasons for this. One, it takes time to make this transition. If you've ever tried to upgrade software on any infrastructure for a company or a government or something, you know that it's complicated and it can take months or years. And so I would I would start now. And the second reason is that there are rumors of hostile players or governments who are archiving things right now so that when their quantum computers become powerful enough, then they can read your mail. And, and uh, so, so our frenemies at uh, the NSA are uh, doing exactly that, uh, and and uh, they they must not be alone. Um, the Chinese, the Russians, everyone who has the capacity of uh, 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 retrieving messages that are not uh, decipherable today uh, are are doing so. Uh, in with the expectation that they are going to be able to do that tomorrow. And the reason why that matters is because a lot of things are uh, intertwined and correlated in space and in time. Uh, so, for example, you may think that your uh, uh, Bitcoin transactions or, or blockchain Tumblr uh, that tries to make as untraceable as possible uh, your your finances uh, is uh, impossible to to track and to some degree that could be true today if you're very good and you know what you are doing otherwise uh, not uh, but uh, in the future uh, it could be reconnected uh, to you and uh, there can be very legitimate reasons uh, for wanting to preserve uh, your uh, uh, privacy, uh, whether uh, financial transactions or, or just uh, plain speech. Uh, if you are uh, an activist uh, uh, in a country uh, whose regime dislikes uh, your activism and you trust current level encryption in the uh, chat applications that you are using, uh, even if their engineering is sound, uh, the um, capturing of the bitstream of your communications could endanger you uh, in, in the future. And are you aware of any, uh, whether it is Telegram or Signal or, or any other uh, communications uh, platforms that are considering uh, upgrading their encryption to employ uh, a, a preliminary version of quantum safe uh, algorithms? Uh, so that they can be an early adopter and deploy it on their network uh, the fastest as soon as a sound uh, 1.0 version of those uh, is available? Off the top of my head, I'm not aware of, of any major communications platform using that, um, but that certainly doesn't mean that they haven't done it already. They what may about not, even be making it public. They, exactly. They may not uh, tell us. And, and, and another one, of course, because uh, when people talk about these applications, they say, oh, Bitcoin is doomed because uh, quantum computers will break uh, uh, Bitcoin en encryption. And, and maybe. Uh, however, the banks are doomed and all our e-commerce worldwide is doomed uh, because that is based on the same uh, encryption algorithms. So 
uh, yes, Bitcoin uh, developers would be hard at work in swapping the encryption with the new one uh, if they were uh, if if they needed to do that right away. But for sure, the pressure on banks is much higher, and and so they will be one of the first uh, to to make sure that uh, our transactions uh, cannot be uh, tampered. Um, very. Can, can yeah. I just add one thing here? Um, so so we've talked about how quantum computers could be used to defeat encryption, but I want to explain in a minute how quantum computers could be used to uh, cause and protect encryption. And uh, and you showed it for a moment, this product Ironbridge that CQC yeah. has come up. It actually uses, it uses quantum technology and uh, and it's actually going back to the, the Bell's theorem that we talked about in the very beginning of, of the session. Be so we, uh, we have this way of entangling quantum particles and using this technique that Bell devised, you can prove that these that these particles are entangled, which means that they're correlated. Now, the reason this is important is that it means that you can prove mathematically that the outcome of these particles when you measure them is probabilistic and has not been tampered with or eavesdropped upon by anyone else. So this means that you have a mathematical proof of randomness and of security. And, and that's, that's amazing because those are the two things that you want when you develop cryptographic keys. You wanna make sure that the key is random and that no one else could possibly know what it is. And and, and this, this has to do with, with a complementary branch of quantum computing, which is, which is quantum communication. Correct, the, correct. The ability to, to, to transmit information potentially over long distances uh, as well, uh, while uh, making sure that, uh, that they are both, uh, uh, they, they retain their integrity and that uh, that people haven't uh, been able to intercept them. Um, Jonathan is is asking uh, a relevant question around this. He says, "Is the architecture of uh, our packet switching, even lower communication protocols, going to to uh, potentially change as a consequence?" There will. There are already plans of a quantum internet, and so. So right now we have a, a digital internet. So the internet, as, as complicated as it is, it only exchanges digital data. It's just ones and zeros at the most basic level. So there are plans for constructing a quantum internet in which you exchange quantum data. So that would either be with, with fiber optics or with lasers in outer space or, or long distances. And both of these have been done in places over, over shorter distances. Uh, so China has a network and Switzerland has a network and uh, I believe one in the UK. And, and they, optics, didn't, China, didn't China communicate with a satellite exactly, as well? Exactly, yeah. So a few years ago, China had this quantum satellite uh, called MISIUS. And uh, and so they used lasers, which, which communicated uh, entangled particles. And so for the reasons I just explained with, this in, with entanglement and the Bell inequality, you can make sure that no one is hacking, no one is eavesdropping or, or tampering. And so this has been done in, in a few proof of concept projects. What will probably happen in the next 20 years is that there will be a worldwide quantum internet. Now, the, the big impediment to why hasn't this happened already is, is that with fiber optics, the photons can only travel a certain distance before they, they just don't make it. Something happens to the photon and they don't make it to the other side. Lasers allow you to go much further than that, but of course lasers are, are expensive and, and such. What we would love is to have a, a quantum repeater. So it means that if you have a, a quantum signal over fiber optics, as long as it makes it a short distance, then it's sort of a, a relay system. So the relay, the repeater will capture that signal and then pass it on again to begin again. So, uh, so we wanna set up this relay system of quantum repeaters throughout the world. And, and, and I'm sure there are already some um, spy uh, or science fiction books uh, that exploit uh, uh, the, the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities uh, of those relays uh, where uh, the protagonist believes everything is fine, but the antagonist uh, knows that it isn't uh, because um, it, it, is, it is hard to um, state, I would think, that the game is over and the defenders have won and the information will be forever safe. 
we will go for a long time in in uh, debugging, uh, upgrading, securing uh, the systems that uh, that on a theoretical basis would work perfectly, but some clever attackers will find a hole, and once they are in, they will they will uh, grab uh, as much as they can. Yeah, yeah. T just to clarify, when I say it's unhackable, uh, when when quantum communication is unhackable, it means that the uh, the the physics is unhackable, but Maybe it was poorly engineered to actually implement this. Maybe the the engineer was bribed to add a backdoor. There, there's all sorts of uh, human elements type things, but and, at and, least and, it itself is secure. And that that is that is one of the more frightening parts because actually uh, there were a few years ago reports of the NSA trying to corrupt the National Institutes of Standards and Technology processes so that a weakened uh, uh, algorithm from a mathematical point of view could be accepted as a standard for elliptic uh, uh, curvature and, and, and encryption, which would have meant that that others trusting the standard uh, uh, were bound to implement something that was uh, was tragically um, uh, open to to hacking. Uh, and and uh, and the naive assumption, of course, by the Americans is that the Chinese are stupid, uh, and they they won't be able to find and exploit the same weakness that the Americans want to, to to leverage. We are all better off with sound systems, with trustable processes, uh, with with uh, um, accountable uh, engineering, uh, rather than um, self defeating uh, tricks of the trade. Um, Mark, we could go for a long time. I think that uh, one of the most important takeaways uh, uh, today uh, is uh, the GitHub repo. Uh, I am very happy and very uh, excited uh, about uh, the, uh, the possibility for smart uh, people uh, to take advantage of uh, Ticket, uh, the uh, quantum cross-compiler that uh, they can uh, play with either on a thir merrily 30-qubit uh, computer simulated on their laptop or the 40-qubit uh, uh, simulated quantum computer on a supercomputer or engaging with you and uh, and uh, working up with a uh, real quantum computer uh, from from IBM, but getting your hands dirty with what it means and start developing the practices and the intuitions as a software developer has been made much more approachable, much more immediately uh, uh, accessible through uh, this uh, recent release uh, by uh, by your company so uh, kudos and 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 thank you uh, so much for for being with me i am certainly going to reach out uh, in a few months time or 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 whenever it's changing uh, rapidly so what exactly. i say today in a few months uh, will look comically outdated and and uh, and uh, and that uh, is is very very interesting i I published a, a few years ago a, a, a paradigm that uh, that looks at what uh, uh, comes after we understand well exponential technologies, and I called the paradigm of jolting technologies, where the doubling rate is shortening, the rate of acceleration is increasing, and I identified as premier examples of that artificial intelligence on one hand, quantum computing on the other. And uh, yeah, AI has been doing that uh, uh, provably, uh, both uh, uh, um, uh, OpenAI and Stanford University published reports, and more recently, the CEO of NVIDIA made announcements documenting this shortening uh, uh, rate of doubling. Uh, and so I am looking forward to uh, seeing uh, jolting changes uh, in the fall, uh, field of quantum uh, computing as well. Th thank you. Yeah, the, the rate of progress in quantum hardware has been extraordinary, much faster than Moore's law. Yes, yes, that's that's exactly it. So, Mark, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will be very, very happy to have you back.
th thank you, David. It's uh, it's been a pleasure to be here anytime. So thank you everyone for following, uh, uh, searching uh, for the question live today. Uh, if you uh, like uh, what uh, you have uh, seen or heard uh, and want to support me and my team, uh, please go to patreon.com slash David Orban, uh, where you can become a supporter uh, or uh, check out this uh, other uh, experiment uh, that I'm uh, excitedly and, and happily following called BitCloud. Uh, where you can uh, invest uh, in the cryptocurrency of individual creators. So there is bitcloud.com slash David Orban. Uh, will it survive? Will it burn? Um, we'll see, but it is a fun little thing. Go and uh, check it out. So thank you uh, very much and uh, see you uh, at uh, the next uh, episode of uh, Searching for the Question Live.